Hi everyone, I'm Howard, the president of Vitamin Amy. We're so excited to collaborate with you and Causely throughout the month of March to protect children from malnutrition, the leading cause of preventable childhood death. Since I founded Vitamin Angels in 1994, we've been fighting malnutrition with vitamins. It's a simple way to save lives and to give children a chance at a healthy future. Every check in this month will provide vitamins to a child in need. With your help, we can put life-changing vitamins into the hands of 70 million at-risk pregnant women, mothers, and children this year. So remember to check in and help us build a healthier world. Good morning, everybody. You guys are the brave ones. You saw the snow and said, you know what, I'm still going to church. And we are so glad that you guys are here. Uh, I believe there's an awesome scripture that says that when two or more gather in his name, there his presence will be. And you guys are here. And I don't want to undermine that even though we are few this morning, we want to worship with all we got, with all our heart. And we want to welcome you. If you're new here. We're glad you're here. Please, uh, when you got here, you got, you got a Connect card, um, a bulletin where you'll find a Connect card that you can rip out. Fill that out as much as possible. We'd love to, uh, for you to give that back to us. Maybe when the offering uh, bag passes by you, or even go to the front, the Connect Center, for a gift from us. And we'd love to have you guys here um, hang out with us more than just today. We want to welcome you. We want to follow up with you. Today, we're also going to be having a uh, welcome, so if you want to meet some of the pastors, you can go over there and meet them and connect with them and let, know a little bit more about us and stuff like that. So why don't you get up with us? We're about to sing, and again, w why don't you just get up with us? And w we're going to sing. We're going to worship God. We're continuing this series called the Red Letter Challenge, and I'm very excited about it. This is week two. Um, there's, there's only a few of us, so I bet you when I say high-five somebody, you'll be able to high-five everybody this year right now. So why don't you go ahead and high-five everybody. Matt and, and, and the team are going to lead us in worship. I'm, I'm very excited about that, so why don't we go ahead and worship God together. All right, let's come together and let's sing this out.
to our God, declaring truth over our lives today. Sing this out, walking around. God never fails. I know the night. Let's sing it out. I know the night won't last. Your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise
hold us in your hands. The same hands that created the earth, the same hands that, that knit us together still are holding us today. And God, no matter what we experience in this life, no matter what heights, what lows, what mountaintops and what valleys that we experience, God, we are still in your hands. If we are on the top of a mountain, God, we are there because you have positioned us there. And if we are in a valley, God, we are there for some reason that we can't understand, but we know that there is hope on the horizon. God, we trust in you. We've seen you move in the past. If we look at what got us here today, we've seen your faithfulness. But many of us today, God, we are looking for more. God, we're looking to see you move again. God, we trust in you. We trust in you.
one more song that we're gonna sing together here and uh, this is a new song Whew, new songs we we love new songs uh, but uh, I, I love this song in particular because this song um, there's a story behind it and I always love when there's stories behind songs it's not just something thrown together this song um, came out of a, a church in California Bethel Church and it it came out of a desperate time for um, the church, who was um, one of the leaders of, of the worship ministry at this church, their son Jackson, he was two years old, he got uh, an E. coli, uh, he got E. coli, and he was on his deathbed, a two-year-old toddler, and um, the, the doctors didn't know what they could do, and one of the other worship leaders received a text message from this other guy saying that his son was probably not going to make it through the night. And as the, 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 the people in the church and as the, the worship leader, as they were all praying, the worship leader just, he, he came up with this song that was just kind of a prayer that he prayed uh, and he, he put music to it and um, let me just sing it for you, it goes like this I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy I raise a hallelujah louder than the ugly. And so the song that he came up with, they began to, to sing it, they began to pray, and they saw this boy Jackson, his life just turn around. And uh, he was healed, and he still lives today. He's three now. And just that story, it just really captured my heart, knowing that in the midst of when it seems like things are so bleak, and, and even if it doesn't turn out the way that we want it to, the way we hope it to, that there's power in our declaring things over our lives. There's power when we sing back to God and we respond back to Him, and we raise a hallelujah back to Him in the presence of our enemies, in the presence of what you are going through today, to declare that today, that I'm not going to let this determine my 
spiritual uh, place. I'm not going to let this determine uh, my view of God and taint my view of God. Instead, I'm going to praise out of this place of, of, of longing. And so can we uh, sing it together? You guys okay with that? Let's sing it together.
Hey, thanks so much for singing with us today, for worshiping with us. You may be seated. Amen, amen. Once again, thank you so much for, for being here, hanging out with us, and braving the snow. I'm glad you got here safe, and we're super excited that you're here. I want to welcome a pretty special group, uh, a group that uh, for over five years has been uh, committing to, to doing something incredible. And, and it's, in fact, this, this group from Pleasant Street Baptist Church and, and Rashid Reyes and Dottie and Bobby and alongside of other individuals. Um, they've committed, check this out, this is awesome. They've committed for, I know that Rashid has been doing this for over five years or so. Every last Saturday of the month, they provide a meal um, for individuals that are experiencing homelessness or, or even families that, that could use a meal that are struggling financially, perhaps, and stuff like that. And um, I'm really excited about just kind of hearing a little bit about um, what's, what's been going on at Pleasant Street Baptist Church. Here at Faith Church, we love supporting missions that are, that are uh, uh, locally and also internationally. And today's Mission Spotlight, so we're going to be kind of sharing a little bit about uh, what's going on with Pleasant Street Baptist Church in Worcester. So uh, why don't you guys say, Hi, Rashid. Hi, Bobby. Hi, Dottie. So, Rashid, um, you, can, you can start us off. What can you tell us? Uh, tell us a little bit about Pleasant Street Baptist and, and the mission there. So, um, this is a community dinner that has been going on for many, many years um, in different forms. Um, um, we came along to Pleasant Street and about five years ago, we started serving there. Um, we come every fourth Saturday. We, the church provides the groceries. We take them there, cook them, and serve the needy, or we call it community dinner, so everybody's invited. And, um, you know, we clean up afterwards, and um, during the service, we got the chance to kind of sit, mingle with, with the folks there, and try to um, bring them into the fold, or just see what what's on their mind. Anything we can, you know, plant the seed of uh, the word of Jesus in there, um, and hopefully they'll have a good meal and they come back the next day for church. That's awesome. That's great. Can I can I just say something? I've been to Rashid's house for food, and make no mistake, this guy is a cook, and his team is amazing. And and the food that they provide for these individuals is not just a ham and cheese sandwich, these guys go all out for these individuals. They show such a great love and compassion through their serving. And Dottie, you, you've been in there for over five years? Do you have, for, for, for how long? No, probably 16 years. Wow, that's incredible. And that's committing to, to at least every fourth Saturday of the month. That's incredible. Pretty much every Saturday, if what? at all possible. <laughs> Are you serious? Every God almost me, God that's gives me the strength. I'm going to be there. <laughs> well, bless your soul. That's incredible. And and you, I, I can already see that God's called you to have such such a great compassion. And Dottie, would you just share with us a little bit about maybe a story or something of significance that that as a result of this mission has taken place in your years? Well, I'm happy to. I had to think about it for a while, and then God just kind of showed me yesterday. Why are you missing this? Uh, there was a, a, a gentleman named Howie who would come faithfully every Saturday to prepare the meal. He did the bulk of the work. He lived in the rooming house just next door to the church. He did not know the Lord. Um, but after, I think it's about 10 years of the years I was there every Saturday, by the pastors, those of us that came and served, just by loving him. Because like all of us, he was far from perfect. But we just loved him through everything. We tried to give him little bits of God's seed. And he would still come every Saturday and serve and say, no, 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 mass isn't for me. <laughs> but I have to say, three years ago, he gave his life to the Lord. <laughs> he came down the aisle at Pleasant Street Baptist Church and was baptized. And um, he, he's just been growing little by little. He's... Um, I said, well, he doesn't go to our church anymore. He's reading God's word. He's doing his devotional. And God always has a plan and a purpose of what he does because about a year after how he came to the Lord, 
Uh, he was diagnosed with small cell lung cancer, not quite stage four, but I have to say, through the whole thing, he never missed a Saturday night to come and serve and cook. And he lived in the neighborhood, so he knew everybody, he loved everybody, he was such a, um, he is a, a, a testimony to what God can do. But in that illness, had he not known the Lord, would he have given up? I don't know, maybe. But he found the strength. You think when you, you know, when you come to the Lord that everything's easy and free. It's not. He still gives you trials and tribulations, and even in his newness in Christ, he got it. He understood that. So he's still my friend. Still see him a couple of, well, at least once a week, because I'm his transportation for his medical appointments. But it was just wonderful to see. I had told Pastor Noel that the day Howie, I've been praying him for every day, the day that he went down that aisle to be baptized, I was going to be dancing in my seat. That's awesome. <laughs> and I didn't get up on my chair because I might fall, but I was <laughs> dancing in the aisle. <laughs> so, yeah. That's awesome. That's such a great story. And it talks to uh, the patient, the compassion, the love that is shown through this ministry and this mission. I mean, this is a, a story of somebody that was, uh, you guys had him uh, work alongside of you guys, and eventually that led them, the, the compassion that was seen uh, led them through to Jesus. That's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing. One last thing. How can we as a church, so, so some of the finances that, that we take up regularly here, some of the giving that takes place also goes towards missions, locally and internationally so but how else can we get involved how can we pray how can we uh it connect with you guys in this mission of yours um, really time you know we, we need people a couple of saturdays a month really and um we are a very small congregation and the people that come to our church are the community of downtown Worcester, which um, unfortunately is a broken community, it's a poor community, it's people who slip through the cracks, but nobody ever slips through God's cracks, and we're there to make sure, do as many as we can, but, but pray for um, relationships, that we can develop relationships that, um, that last, and that we will see these people come back. It takes a long time to develop relationships with the people who come to our um, community dinner because they've been hurt, they've been yelled at, they've been, and they suffer from addictions. Some are lost. Some, I mean, some are lonely. Some are homeless. Some just live in rooming houses next door. And once a week they come in, and and we want to love them and give them a good meal. And it's, and it's as close to a family environment of as many of these people will see. There, um, so I, I would pray that we can establish relationships because. There's a relationship when they see Rashid and they see um, Bobby, they see Kevin. They see the same people come back constantly. They know they can put a trust in their, their being there and just going out and sitting and chatting with them. Um, they know they can talk to them. But again, for relationships, um, God always provides the funds. There's never a shortage. There's always enough. But we get... Um, there's not many of us at Pleasant Street who have the ability to go and serve this way. So <laughs> sometimes it's, it, we get a little weary. We really do. So pray God's strength for all of us and our new pastors and their families. Um, and just for God's protection over all the ministries and everything that, that we try and uh, accomplish in the name of Jesus there at Pleasant Street. Amen. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what. Go ahead. I'm going to add that... Um if you're interested in helping, uh, Bobby's um, kind of organizing the volunteers for every Saturday we serve. Um, they serve every Saturday. We serve only, we're partnering with them only on the fourth Saturday of the month. So if you have a four hours, so it's not a, bit, a long commitment. It's uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon to 7 o'clock. So if you're free that Saturday, you want to come help or just have dinner with us, you're welcome to do it. And then uh, Bobby is the... Uh, organizer to make sure we don't have too many volunteers or too little volunteers so feel free to uh that's bobby or i know amen i i want to say one last thing before we pray for this group you know oftentimes we're here and we we share the gospel through words but man what an impact these individuals are making with sharing the gospel through their service amen so let's pray 
uh, let's pray for this group and yeah, be sure to have an, uh, you're invited to volunteer, help out and give some time to, to God's good work alongside of this team. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you so much for these souls and I just pray God that you would honor their commitment, their compassion, their love and God, while sometimes we see these this time as time give, given up and sacrifice, God, these individuals that undeniably don't see it that way, they see this as an opportunity to live life to the fullest and to love on people. So this is not time given up. Um, God, this is time well used for your glory. And I just pray, God, that as we consider that and that posture in our lives, that we would consider helping out as a church even further. Um, God, we thank you so much, and we ask the Holy Spirit to be involved in the, in the hearts of individuals that come to get fed physically, but God, that the Holy Spirit would spark something in their hearts as well. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Well, hey, uh, we're going to take up our morning offering, and we're going to ask the ushers to get ready. Um, just, uh, just two quick things that I want to share. Uh, our youth ministry has actually served uh, during uh, one of the Saturdays, and I've had students, hey, listen, you need to coordinate more of these because we want to come back. We want to help out even more. And I'm going to tell you guys right now, there may be some of you guys that are in my small group. Heads up, we're going to be doing this within the next few months. We're going to take up a, a Saturday, and we're going to help out. It's a lot of fun. It's a great way for us to connect with one another as well. We're going to ask uh, Arshas to start moving forward and collecting our morning offering. I mean, this is why we give. Obviously, we give towards missions like this that, that allow us to spread the gospel locally um, as well. And, and really, all, the, all what we do here at Faith Church and what you give towards is to love and lead people into a growing faith in Jesus. And everything we do is for that reason. And for those of you that just got here, we're just glad you're here. Just fill that connect card. If you didn't get a chance to put it in the giving bag, go to the Connect Center for a gift from us. Remember that, that there's going to be a welcome reception afterwards, and we'd we'll love to meet with you there. One quick announcement, and that is this. Next week, if you may know this, you, or you're here for the first time, you also know that we are in the process of moving. I mean, we're actually taking steps towards moving because we want to have more parking lots available for you guys to park. And, and on days that there's not really bad weather, so you, you know that there's a lot of individuals that come here. Sometimes a parking space is hard to find. But that's not the only reason why we're moving towards a bigger place. We believe that God is calling us uh, to also reach further. And that said, we're, we're hoping to, to have a facility to help us with our mission to love and lead people into a growing faith in Jesus. So next Sunday, there's going to be an incredibly important special business meeting that we'll love for you to attend, if you're a member, after the 11 o'clock service. We're continuing the series, the Red Letter Challenge. Let's check out this video because I'm excited for week two of this series. God bless. We live in an interactive world where new social media challenges pop up all the time. Some for enjoyment, some for a good cause, others are just plain dangerous. What if you tried a new challenge? One that could transform your life, community, and the world. What if you spent 40 days studying Jesus' words and applying his teachings to everyday life? All focused on five principles. Being, forgiving, serving, giving, and going like Christ. So what are you waiting for? Let's join together and take the Red Letter Challenge. Well, good morning, everyone. So good to be with you today. We're on our sixth day of reading right now on the Red Letter Challenge. I hope it's been a good week for you. I have been so excited, not just the readings, mind you, but also the posts. If you haven't caught the posts online, they're on, they're on our Facebook page. And you get a chance to kind of not only read the devotional and the Red Letter Challenge, but also read what some of you have written. And that has been really inspiring. I think I've enjoyed that more than even the book. If you need a book, it's still not too late. You can get one today. They're on the back table um, if, for a donation of $10. That'd be great. Uh, but we're on our sixth day. Have you ever started something that you haven't finished? <laughs> uh, probably too many of us can say yes to that. 
Um, I remember back in college, it was my freshman year, um, I had worked all my way through high school to try to afford college, so I hadn't played too many sports. But lo and behold, I thought, you know, when I'm in college freshman year, why not go out for the soccer team? I could do that. Never having played before, I thought, what's so hard about soccer? Come on. Uh, and so the first day of soccer camp came, and we were stretching out, you know, doing everything that you do to kind of stretch out. Everything is good. And, you know, I'm a short distance runner, at least a I, I thought I could do that. I could sprint. I'm not a good marathon a distance runner. So they just started out on a jog, like a little jog. You know, the whole soccer team is just jogging across the field. And I could kind of tell they're jogging across, and they're going to go, you know, kind of up this trail. And, I, you know, I'm cool with that. And I thought, you know, I, man, these guys, they're slow. These soccer players are like really, like, man, I can. So, man, I sprinted out to the, 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 the beginning of the pack, man, and I am just I'm cranking it. I am like so far ahead of everybody else. I thought, how hard is this? Come on. Until we got to a hill, and I should have known better because they called it Devil's Back. <laughs> I'm at a Christian college. You come to a, a, a hill that's called Devil's Back, it must be pretty bad, and it was. It, it's, it was like Mount Washington. I, I mean, mind you, and, and I, it's straight up. And I hit that, and all of a sudden, it, it, everything is aching in me. And I'm seeing player after player, you know, my teammates just passing me one after another after another. And I get to maybe a quarter of the way, maybe a third of the way up, and I just got to stop. I'm done. Like, I, 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 I could kind of walk my way up to the top of this mountain called Devil's Back. By the time I got to the top... They'd all gone, and, and there were like three different trails there. I didn't know which trail to take. I mean, I was lost in the woods at this point. I'd like to tell you that, you know, that was a good year of soccer, but it wasn't a good season of soccer. I did make it through the season, and I actually did finally get to the top of Devil's Back without stopping. But those opening runs, five-mile runs, was just more than I could do. So I never played soccer again after that. I'm, I was done. John Acuff says in his book, Finish, 92% of us don't finish well. That we don't follow through on the promises that we make, the resolutions that we put forth in our lives. 92% of us don't finish. So we come to the Red Letter Challenge. It would be such a huge failure if, in fact, 92% of us didn't finish well, didn't finish the 40 days and the Red Letter Challenge. To me, that'd be a, such a great failure. So I'm here at the outset of this sermon just to keep encouraging you to say, keep on reading and don't give up. This is so critical for us. Remember the problem we said last week? The problem that we live in a world where the world on the outside doesn't too much like us, or at least think much of us. They, they, they're not so uh, against Jesus, but they're against Jesus followers because many Jesus followers have rejected those people who are on the outside. And so, so we've got a, a huge task ahead of us to try to live more like Jesus. That's what this is all about. This Red Letter Challenge series is all about trying to live more like Jesus so that people in the world can see us for who we ought to be or should be, more like Christ in our lives. So that's our target. And our, our big aim, our big bullseye that we've been kind of aiming at or what, that we will be aiming at for these next five Sundays are these five targets, five principles being, let's say them together, okay? Being, forgiving, serving, giving, going. Those are the five main targets that we as a congregation are going to focus on. That's the focus of the Red Letter Challenge. Now, you'll notice that four of them, the last four, are pretty much along the lines of doing. They, they involve some activity, of really involving ourselves in something, putting ourselves kind of out there. The first one isn't. And here's what we got to say from the outset here. That being 
comes before doing. Before you focus on those four, we better get that straight today, the one for today, which is all about being. The fact that Jesus isn't so much inviting us into a religion of doing, do, 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 do. That's the rest of the world. That's the religions of the rest of the world. Jesus is inviting us into a love relationship, a relationship where we are uh, in union with him, feeling strong, feeling his strength moving in and through us. See, because here's the bottom line. I can start strong on my own, on my own strength, but I can't finish strong on my own strength. I could, I could start the Christian life out kind of well, but if I am going to be relying on my own strength to get me through every single day of my Christian life, I am going to fail miserably. And I have to learn the essence of what it means to be with Jesus. And I just got to tell you, a lot of us, we struggle with this, self-included. I'm not a good be-er. I'm a good doer. Get me to do, and I'll do. I like activity. I like, you know, throwing myself into projects. I'm a type A kind of personality. But get me to rest, to be, not so much. Um, there's one sport that I have never, ever engaged in or done. Anybody ever done rowing? I, I have not rowed. Nobody. Nobody's here has ever rowed. I mean, you see them out in Lake Quinsigman, right? Um, you know, those rowers, and they have like one-man rowers and two. You know what the one that has always impressed me? The eight-man rowers. They're in synchronicity, are they not? In fact, that's the only way to win. If you want to win in those eight-man or eight-person rowing events, you have to be timed exactly together. Your oars have to go into the water at precisely the same moment. They have to come out of the water at the same moment. And you know what's different about rowing than any other sport? It's the only sport that you're not looking at the target. <laughs> You're not looking where you're going. You're looking where you've been. And so all eight persons there in that doubloon, whatever, whatever it is, that, what do they, what do they call them? Boat? <laughs> Ship? <laughs> whatever. <laughs> you're, you're pointed away from the target, and there's only one person who's looking at the target and where you ought to go. Can anybody tell me the name? Co close, not quite the coach. The coxswain. The coxswain is the person who sits in the very back and he orders your life. <laughs> he tells you when to stroke, when to put that paddle in the water, when to take it out. And, and man, you get a good coxswain and you get a good crew who's following that coxswain and it has their eyes on the coxswain. Man, that's a recipe for victory. Isn't that the Christian life? How many times, how many times in the Bible are we called to keep our eyes on Jesus? You know, Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the writer's talking about all the many faithful people down through the ages who have trusted in the Lord. And, and, and goes on to say, we're surrounded by all these people. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that's so easily entangled and do what? Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Let's keep our eyes on him. So, so part, part of what it means to be with Jesus is to kind of fix our eyes on Jesus, to keep our eyes on him. And we're going to hear this morning in the scriptures the greatest invitation that has ever been given by the greatest person who ever lived. And it comes to us in this gracious tone. It is, it is an invitation of all invitations. And, and what do you do with an invitation? A wedding invitation, a shower invitation, an anniversary, 50th anniversary, wedding anniversary invitation. What do you do with an invitation? You forget it? No. <laughs> you RSVP, right? 
So kind of at the end of this sermon, there's going to be an RSVP moment when you and I get to respond back to this great invitation. Some of us know this invitation. It's found in Matthew chapter 11. You know, some of us have memorized this. Maybe we memorized it as a kid. In fact, it is so critical and so essential. I kind of want you to do something with me this morning. Can we just kind of say it together? Would you, would, you, would you help me out here? Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, let's start. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Can anybody say amen to that? Weary and burdened. Now, you know how much I love the languages and all that. Would, would, you, would you indulge me just for a moment here? and t- Let me tell you about these two words. Weary means worn out, exhausted, fatigued. I moved my daughter uh, out of her second-story apartment on Friday. Today I am fatigued. My whole body is screaming right now. My muscles, every last one of them, are fatigued and exhausted. It's in the present tense here. And present tense means continuous tense. So in other words, Jesus is saying, come to me, all you who are continually feeling this exhaustion and this this, uh, worn out sense within you. But but burdened here is, is a different tense altogether. This is really interesting. Jesus kind of says it uh, differently. And, and the word there, burden, means overloaded. It's a word that's used um, when ships were overloaded. When ships were um, put, in a pl- put in a dangerous place by putting too much cargo in it. That, that's the same word here. And it's in the perfect tense, not the present tense. Perfect tense means completed tense, uh, means you're done. In other words, you're, you're overloaded up to here kind of thing. Like, like you're weary, you're tired out, and you are at this completed, perfected state of being overloaded. Now, now some of you know what that means when, when you're moving, right? Like, I determined on Friday to get a moving van that was large enough. I wasn't going to be stuck there in Haverhill with a moving van that just wasn't big enough for all of her stuff. So I oversized this vehicle, and we were okay. But I have been in situations before. I remember moving my parents from western New York out to Massachusetts, And I had the biggest U-Haul vehicle that you could ever have, you know? I mean, it took up like, you know, I think I was driving, it felt like a semi. Um, and, and, And I remember getting to the end, and it was all stacked up. I mean, there was not one inch that was taken up. And Mom stood there at the back of the truck with a box, one more box. It was a box of boxes. Empty boxes. I kid you not. Some of you heard this story before. Mom, mom, mom loved, you know, these little boxes, you know, because she loved to give gifts away to people, and she'd stick things in it. So she just needed to have this box of boxes. And so I'm at, I'm, I'm at an overloaded state right now. I say, Mom, we get to Massachusetts. I'll get you more boxes. There's no more room. And so that was the only time that mom and I had words, but we had words over this box of boxes. And you know what? After mom passed away and I'm cleaning out her stuff, guess what I found? I found the box of boxes. That little sneak had gotten it onto that truck somehow. (laughs) That's what it means when our lives are overloaded. We feel like we can't stick anything else in. We can't, we can't nudge things a different way. We are at that point of no return, and there's no going back, and we just feel we can't, we can't do anymore. Have you ever been there? I, I think Jesus is speaking to all of us here at this point. Now, now I want you to think of it this way. Some of us know what this means emotionally. We're... Uh, we're, we're at a breaking point in our lives, emotionally. Some of us know what this means, perhaps mentally, intellectually. 
You know, maybe we're taking college courses, we're in school, and man, you know, I'm just overloaded. Some of us certainly know this, what this means or what it's like to be physically overloaded and physically burdened. But I want to share with you, I think there's another thing Jesus is talking about here. I think there's a way in which you and I can become spiritually, religiously overburdened. See, that's where the Israelites were at. Living in this day, the Israelites were overburdened by man-made traditions, man-made laws. The Pharisees were the religious leaders. They were the elites. And they were so much captivated and so much wanted to protect the laws of God, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, 613 laws. They created thousands and thousands and thousands of other laws around it that you had to obey or else. So if you obeyed these laws, then you'd be able to obey that law, the law of God. So they had these man-made laws, thousands of them. That's what Jesus reacted to. You resisted those man-made laws. <laughs> How many of us grew up maybe in that kind of a religiosity? You know, it wasn't Christianity, it was churchianity. It was living by religion, and so we lived under this cloud. You see, the Pharisees had a wrong view of God, didn't they? Their view of the Old Testament God was He's demanding, He's rigid, He's requiring, and if you don't measure up, shame on you. He'll zap you. <laughs> that's, not, that's not who Jesus is. That's not, how, that's not who God is. The Psalms themselves say what? That he is patient, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He's not a rigid God. He's a loving, merciful, patient, gracious God. And so Jesus says, come. That's one of his favorite words. Come to me. You're weary from all of this religiosity. You're overburdened with shame and doubt and guilt and condemnation. Come to me. I'm not like that. I, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to zap you. I'm here to, to love on you and care for you. Come to me. Again, not many of us are very good at this, are we? We're, we're not just good at resting. What do we do when you go on vacation? When I go on vacation, oh, I am a type A person on vacation. We've got to do, 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 do. How different from my wife? She could sit on a beach. How many of you are like that? You sit on a beach and just read. That's my wife. Just sit on the beach and read. I can't do that. I've got to be up and around and about and seeing the sights. And, you know, I want to, I want to you know, that's what it was like just a couple of weeks ago when we were in Florida. And, I, and, and you know what? I, I seriously have to tell you, I was grumpy. I, I'm going to tell you more of the story in a moment. But for some of us, we are doing, 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 and we are grumpy, grumpy, grumpy. And all Jesus says is, just come to me. Back in the Old Testament, Isaiah, the prophet, Isaiah is talking about the Messiah to come. He, he's, he's kind of looking through the keyhole into the future, and he's kind of portraying what, what Jesus is going to be like. And in Isaiah chapter 9, what does he say? There's five characteristics that he outlines there. That, that this marvelous Messiah, that he shall be wonderful, counselor, almighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Shalom. Prince of Peace. Hey, Jesus wants to bring peace into the heart of our lives. Come to me, all you who are weary, overloaded, burdened. I want to give you rest. Going on to verse 29. Let's read it together again. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Okay, if you didn't grow up on a farm, maybe you don't know what a yoke is. We had a yoke hanging up in our living room. You didn't? My dad had converted a yoke into two hanging lamps, so that was our living room, you know? 
um, early American farm. That was, that was the, what we had in our, in our living room. Um, I remember it well. A yoke was something that you put on two animals, not one animal, to pull a plow or a wagon or something. Because a farmer couldn't do these things on his own. He couldn't, he couldn't plow by himself. He had to have the help not just of one animal, two are better than one. And so a yoke was meant to be something that two animals together, yoked together, could do the work together. What's Jesus saying? I want to be alongside of you. I want to be with you. I want to help you in your struggle. In all of your activities, I want to be there right beside you, helping you pull the weight that you have to pull. I, you, you don't have to do this alone. You don't have to live this life by yourself, all by yourself, doing the work. And I know you, New Englander. <laughs> I know you so well because I'm like you. We're so self-sufficient, are we? We're so, we're so self-reliant. Um, my, my granddaughter, little Farron, you know, she's going to turn three in just a couple of months. And Farron's favorite words right now? Self. <laughs> I do myself. Like, like she wants to get into a high chair by herself. She can get into bed by herself. She can, uh, she can get into her car seat by herself. She can feed herself. Everything is self. And then we grow up, and it's the same old, same old, isn't it? We can do it by our self. Uh, John Henry Jowett was one of the famous preachers in the late uh, 1800s, early 1900s. Some have said he was the greatest preacher of all times. I didn't hear him, so I don't know that. But here's what he says about this. The fatal mistake for the believer is to seek to bear life's load in a single collar. God never intended man to carry his burden alone. Christ, therefore, deals only in yokes. A yoke is a neck harness for two. And the Lord himself pleads to be the one of the two. He wants to share the labor of any galling task. The secret of peace and victory in the Christian life is found in putting off the taxing collar of self and accepting the master's relaxing See, if you're weary and overburdened, there's a reason. The reason could be the fact that you're trying to do it on your own. If there is no peace, then you do not have the Prince of Peace. Um, we, are, uh, we live in a world, don't we? We're all chasing after it, the elusive it. And so we're on our hamster wheels. And every single day, what did Lily Tomlin say once? Um, I'm trying to remember. He says, at the end of the day, um, we're all running a rat race. But, but truly, we're the rat in the race. <laughs> and we're just running, running the rat race. Uh, Harrison Ford, uh, just a couple of years ago, here's the uh, $260 million man. That's, that's what he's worth. You know, he's got it all. I mean, you, you name it, Harrison Ford's got it. And he said, we're all chasing after what we ain't got. We're all chasing after what we ain't got. And the interviewer said, and what don't you got? What, 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 don't you, what ain't you got? And, and quickly, Harrison Ford said, peace. Here's the guy that's got everything. But we don't, he, he doesn't have his peace. And, and if you're like me, then you really need to just rest in these verses here, settle in, zoom in on these verses and say, I need to take Jesus as my yoke. I need to invite him into this. See, because just a couple of weeks ago, this is ongoing for me, by the way. I haven't learned this. I'm just saying. I, this is, your pastor is not there yet, okay? I was on vacation. Three grumpy, grumpy days. I'm in paradise. I'm in Florida. We're on Sanibel Island. The beaches are white sea shells all over. It should be gorgeous. I should be just swimming in it all. And I was grumpy, terribly grumpy. You know why? Because there was a weight around my neck, a weight on my shoulders. I was feeling the weight of everything back here. I was feeling the weight of a building project that we may be doing, you know, in a, in a year or two or three. And, and I was thinking, how can we afford it? What are we going to do? Can I really do another building project? Yada, yada, yada. 
And I was terrible to be around. Until we got to a store, and we're shopping around the store. Like, I hate being here at the store. <laughs> Stupid stuff. <laughs> then there was one little plaque that said, where God guides, God provides. Stupid sign. <laughs> and suddenly, the song starts ringing through the mountain. I see you move. You move the mountains, and I believe I'll see you do it again. I didn't ask Matt to sing that song this morning. That's the song that keeps coming to my, my mind over and over again about all of what God is hopefully going to do in the next few years. I see the, I've seen you do it before. Great is your faithfulness, God. I believe you're going to do it again. Where God guides, God provides. It's just resting in Jesus. And here's the last verse. Let's say it together again. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now make no mistake, the Christian life is not devoid of any work whatsoever. There is a work to be done, isn't there? You know, some have said the Christian life is maybe even the hardest life to live. But it's a good life, an easy life. Because the, the, the life apart from Jesus, it sinks us down. And we start to get weighed down by the world's cares and the world's stuff. But we have a Savior who says, I want to take that from you. I want to lighten your load. I want to help you pull this yoke that you're in. See, we're, for some of us, we're living this ragged life, aren't we? We're running, running, running so fast. Robert Murray McShane was a famous preacher a couple hundred years ago, Scottish preacher, and he died at the ripe old age of 30 years old because he had burned himself out for Jesus, and he had run himself into the ground, and his friend was at his deathbed there, again, 30 years of age. His friend was there at his deathbed, and he said, God gave me two things. He gave me a message to deliver and a horse to deliver it. I fear that I have killed the horse. Some of us are killing the horse, aren't we? We're running our lives in a ragged way, and all Jesus is saying is saying, come on, just come. I'll give you peace. I'll give you rest. I'll help you figure it out. I'll help you pull this weight. I, I, I'm not a demanding Savior. I'm not... I'm not rigid. I'm not requiring. I'm, I'm loving. I'm gracious. I'm patient. Just come to me. I'm going to help you. Um, Eugene Peterson wrote a translation of the Bible that we call the message. If you've ever read the message, just puts it into just modern day language. And I, and I read what Eugene Peterson wrote, how he translated these verses. Can I read it for you right now? It's real special. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. So what's the point? The point is this. If you want to live like Jesus, hang with Jesus. We become like those we hang out with. You become like the people you surround yourselves with. If you surround yourself on a daily basis with Jesus, get, guess what? You'll start living like Jesus. You'll start having that peace and that shalom. You know, some of the most wonderful moments in my life are times when I have been just with Jesus, when I've spent time with Him in His presence. You know, and I'm not saying that you can't do other things, you know, I like to play golf. 
I like to watch a good movie with my wife. I like to go out to restaurants, and I like to have a good time. But here's the reality. Good things can become bad things when they become God things. If, it, if it's driving Jesus out from the center of your life, then it's bad. And that's becoming an idol. You need time with Jesus. And you say, well, how do I do that? All right, let me just try to end this with just some of these things right here. First of all, be with Jesus in church. Um, it was a hard getting here this morning, wasn't it? And I know right now I'm preaching to the choir. Maybe some of you are watching at home right now, and that's okay. But you can't live continuously a life outside of the fellowship of God's people and be with Jesus. You just can't. And I, and I, you know, I talked to people, saw, talked to somebody a couple weeks ago who said, oh, I don't come to church, but me and Jesus are just fine. I beg to differ. I don't, think you, I don't think you can be good with Jesus and stay away from the places where he is at. And I don't know about you, but man, when I was worshiping God back there, singing some of the, that last song, that's a killer song, man. And I was just singing a hallelujah to the Lord. That's where we be with Jesus. And when you can be here Sunday after Sunday and, and sing these songs and worship him and get your eyes off yourself and onto him, you are with Jesus. You got to keep doing that. Be with Jesus in reading God's word, in the Bible, a reading plan. You know, my greatest hope, my greatest hope is that this 40 days of challenge that gets you into this regimen, you start reading every single day, that you're going to finish. You're going to follow up this devotional with a reading plan in God's word, and you're just going to every single day, just a little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit, but you're just going to fill yourself with God's word, and you're going to hear Jesus speak to you through his word. Be with Jesus also in a small group. Boy, in my small group, there are times when Jesus is speaking to me through them. Their care, their compassion, even their accountability. Times when, when they're talking and I feel like I'm listening to the words of Jesus. You got to be in a small group because that's where you get fed and where you get nurtured, where Jesus is very much a part of, of what's going on there. And you get to be Jesus for somebody else there in the group. Be with Jesus when you pray. Just, just sometimes not just bringing your list to Jesus, but allowing him to speak in the quietness of those moments too. And just being still before him, last but not least, when you Sabbath. Friday morning, don't try to call me. I'm not going to answer my phone. Most of Friday, I'm not going to answer my phone. But Friday morning especially, because I got two things in front of me. My Bible and a cup of coffee. Got to have my coffee too. <laughs> Man, those are sweet moments to me. I get restored, refreshed. I go away from those moments, I feel like I could take on the world after that. But you need those. You need this. This is how we be with Jesus. And you know what? And I'm not trying to say any of this this morning to lay a guilt trip on anybody, okay? All I'm saying is, start. Where do you want to start this week? What do you want to... You got to work at resting in Jesus. <laughs> there is kind of a, a work here to be done. Just come to him this week. He wants your presence. The greatest invitation by the greatest person who ever lived. Let's stand for prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this amazing invitation. It's our privilege right now to RSVP to say yes. We're going to do it. We're going to come closer to you than we have ever come before. And it's a good thing. And you'll fill us with the kind of, of strength that we cannot find anywhere else. So, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this time together. Thank you for, uh, for being such a gracious Savior to us. We pray in your great name. Amen. Hope you have a great week this week.
go into the Red Letter Challenge. Uh, we uh, read today six, tomorrow day seven, and on and on. So have a great week. God bless. And be safe on the roads. <laughs>